Hello, my name is Jennifer Fenney. I'm a member of the staff for the UW's Health Sciences Institutional Review Board office. And I'll be giving a brief introduction to what institutional review boards, or IRBs if they're more as they're more commonly known, are and what they do. To, to start off with, what is an institutional review board? It's a committee that's required by United States federal regulations. Uh, which require IRB oversight for most research involving human participants. IRBs are based in institutions that conduct this kind of research, which is why they're called institutional review boards. This allows IRBs to take local context into account when they are reviewing research. IRBs focus on participants in research, so all the kinds of questions that an IRB asks and the kinds of determinations it needs to make all have to do with how research affects the people who are subjects of that research. There's a wide variety of research conducted here at the UW, and so the UW has four different IRBs with different expertise. There are two health sciences IRBs that work closely together and share a main office and support staff. The larger Health Sciences IRB um, reviews primarily clinical trials in testing investigational drugs, devices, or other interventions, while the Health Sciences Minimal Risk IRB reviews primarily medical records research, survey research, research databases, and the like. So um, the IRB that a particular research project goes to has to do with the nature of the research and the expertise of the board. What do IRBs review? A wide variety of research. Um, there's a list on slide three that gives you an idea of the types of activities that fall into the broad category of human subjects research. And it should be kept in mind that in most cases, research that requires IRB approval before it can begin also requires continued IRB oversight throughout the life of the study. The IRB needs to review the study's progress at least once a year and approve it to continue. And any time an investigator wants to make a change to the, to the study, the IRB needs to review and approve that change before it can be implemented. There are some limited exceptions to the requirement for continued IRB oversight. Uh, there are certain types of minimal risk research, such as retrospective medical record review or research involving unidentifiable existing biologic samples that can be exempt from federal requirements for continued IRB oversight. But it's the IRB rather than the researcher that makes the decision about whether a particular project meets exemption criteria. For a more precise understanding of what kinds of research an IRB has to review, let's look at the definitions of human subject and research. These definitions appear on slides four and five. On the surface, they may seem pretty clear cut. In practice, they can be difficult to interpret, which is a large part of the reason why the IRB, rather than researchers, decide whether these, uh, whether these definitions apply or not. So a human subject, according to the main regulation governing IRBs, which is known as the common rule, a living subject is a, a, a human subject is a living individual about whom an investigator conducting research obtains data through intervention or interaction or identifiable private information obtained for research in a way that can be, where the information can be associated with the person either by direct identifiers or a code that can be linked back to a person's identity. So keep in mind that this definition can mean that a research uh, project can involve human subjects even if the researcher doesn't really do anything directly with subjects. Collecting certain kinds of information about people or using biological samples from them often requires IRB review, review and approval, even if the researcher never sees the people that uh, the information is about. The definition of research covers a broad range of activities, um, but it focuses on investigations that are both systematic and generalizable. So this means that not every instance of data collection or intervention with people counts as research. But this too can be difficult to, uh, to interpret in practice, and the IRB um, struggles sometimes deciding whether something is research or not. In slide six, the next slide, we move from what an IRB reviews to how an IRB looks at research studies. 
IRB review is based on a set of basic ethical principles that were first published in 1979 in a document known as the Belmont Report, which I mention only because if you do any other reading about human subjects, protections issues, you will run into references to this report. The basic ethical principles that the Belmont, Belmont Report presents are respect for persons, which has to do with the, uh, the right of people to make decisions about their own lives and uh, their voluntary participation in research and their uh, right to know about research that they're going to participate in and make decisions about whether they want to be in it or not. A corollary to that is that people with limited autonomy, such as children, prisoners, people with cognitive impairment, um, need additional protections if they're going to be research participants to make sure that their rights and welfare are protected. The, con the principle of beneficence has to do with maximizing the benefits of research while minimizes the potential, minimizing the potential harm from research. And the principle of justice means that uh, both risks and benefits should be fairly distributed among the population. To ensure that the basic ethical principles in the Belmont Report are implemented in a consistent way by institutional review boards, IRBs are required to follow a variety of different sets of regulations, and these are listed on slide 7. Um, what you should take away from this slide is that there are an awful lot of detailed, um, esoteric um, points that an IRB needs to keep track of when reviewing research studies and deciding whether those studies are approvable. But um, it's probably more useful to think about the basic criteria for IRB review, which are much more accessible than the regulations themselves and useful for researchers to keep in mind. So slide eight lists some of these basic criteria. All research entails some risk or burden Sometimes that may be no more than the inconvenience involved in filling out a survey. Um, in other cases, the research that an IRB reviews involves very high risks. Uh, for example, studies of investigational drugs or devices can involve potentially fatal side effects. So those are physical risks, and those are fairly easy to pick out. Um, but risks are not just physical. Research can also have uh, psychological or emotional or even legal risks to subjects. So for example, research on illegal or stigmatizing behaviors can have legal fallout uh, for subjects. Research on emotionally traumatic experiences can have severe psychological risks. So an IRB needs to decide whether the inherent risks of a study are balanced by uh, potential benefits and the risks themselves are reduced as much as possible. And ways that that can be done are through careful subject selection, uh, safety monitoring, supportive care for medical interventions, and special confidentiality protections. The riskier a study is, the greater the potential benefit needs to be in order for the risks to be justified. But even a study that's pretty low risk needs to advance knowledge in some way in order for the, the balance between risk and benefit to be there and for it to be ethical for someone to take on any risk or burden associated with research. And this needed balance between risks and benefits leads to study design related questions from the IRB. Researchers sometimes get irritated when IRBs ask about study design because it seems that the IRB is overstepping its bounds and starting to do scientific review, which is not really its, its job. But the IRB does have the responsibility to look at design to the extent that it has an impact on the risk-benefit ratio and therefore on the ethics of conducting a research project. So for example, if you're doing a study with a new device that hasn't been tested in people before, and you're proposing to test it in children, there needs to be a strong justification for doing this because the principles of beneficence and justice require that research involves the least vulnerable participants possible. So if it's in any way possible to use adults, for example, for an initial trial of a drug or device, then that would be preferable to beginning work on that, on that device or drug in children or in some other vulnerable population. 
Another design issue that might catch the IRB's eye is um, a design that is too weak to yield valid results, for example, because the subject population is, um, is too small, or the sample size is too small, or the analysis is not well defined, the data collection points and the outcome measures are not well defined. If a study is not going to yield valid results because of these design flaws, then it's unethical to expose human subjects to risks from the research because it won't have any real benefit for anyone, either the participants themselves or society in general. And finally, uh, the ethical principle of respect for persons means that the IRB has to put a lot of emphasis on the informed consent process, that is, how people learn about the research, um, do they understand what the research entails for them, both in terms of the, the nature of the research, what they'll be asked to do, as well as the risks and potential benefits, if any, to them. And the IRB looks at whether consent is obtained in a way that really allows people to make an informed and voluntary decision about whether they will participate. So moving on to slide nine, we have some tips for successful IRB submissions. The first of which is to educate yourself about local requirements and procedures. The regulations and the basic, basic review criteria that we discussed above will be the same for any IRB anywhere in the United States, but each institution will have its own related requirements, such as requirements for human subject research training, It'll have their local, own local policies and submission procedures, and so wherever you find yourself planning to do research involving human subjects, you should familiarize yourself with these institutional requirements. This slide includes two web links to websites that are good places to start familiarizing yourself with the UW's requirements. One is for the university's Human Research Protection Program, and this gives a broad orientation about the whole, <clears throat> the whole approach to um, human research protections on this campus, as well as some step-by-step -step guidance for researchers about where you begin with training, how you decide which IRB would be appropriate for your research, and how you go about submitting a research proposal to the IRB. Also, the Health Sciences IRB website, which is the second link on the slide, gives you a way of finding forms, instructions for submitting items to the IRB, but it also provides a lot of guidance on a wide variety of human subjects related issues, such as um, whether a student project would require IRB review or not, um, requirements about self-experimentation, when that requires IRB review or not. Um, and uh, recruitment procedures, informed consent processes, expect expectations for protecting subjects' privacy. All of these pieces of information are available on the website. It's a good place to start. Another good idea for a successful IRB submission is to think when you're designing a study um, about what the research would look like from the participant's point of view and to think about what you're asking people to do and why. Um, think about how much of a time commit pe commitment people need to make, um, what the participants' perceptions of risks or burdens will be, uh, what the realistic benefits might be, including the possibility that they won't, they won't benefit at all, in which case you need to figure out a way of explaining why they should participate in the first place and what the benefit to society might be. I also think <clears throat> when planning the informed consent process and document about what research pr procedures might be familiar to people so that they don't require a whole lot of explanation and which ones people may never have encountered before which will need to be explained in a way that they can understand so that they can decide yes I'm willing to put up with that or no I don't want to have anything to do with this. Also keep in mind when preparing IRB submissions that you need to provide enough information for the IRB so that the IRB can determine whether a study meets the review criteria that they need to, um, they need to evaluate. An IRB can't base its determinations on assumptions about what the PI intends to do or on generalizations about how things will be done. <clears throat> 
Applications need to include sufficient detail to allow the IRB to say that risks are minimized, <coughs> that the subject population is appropriate, and uh, that the study makes sense to do, that the study design is appropriate, that there's a reason to conduct this research in the first place. Also keep in mind that if information that's presented to the IRB is confusing or conflicting, as sometimes happens when multiple documents are presented to the IRB, we can't determine if review criteria are satisfied, and so that will lead to questions. Finally, um, you can feel free to consult with IRB staff. The UW Health Sciences IRB staff are uh, well-versed in all the ethical principles, regulatory issues, local policies, and how our local IRB thinks about things as well. So we have a good idea of what the IRB is expecting, as well as you know, the nuts and bolts of what requirements need to be met. And we can answer questions during the planning stages as well as during the submission process. And in fact, uh, once research proposals are submitted for IRB review, the staff does a lot of work with them and works with investigators to help them bring their proposals into line with what the IRB will need in order to approve the study. So with these tips for, um, for IRB submission and with the other information provided in this introduction, we hope that it will make, um, make you more aware of what IRBs are, what they do, and how to use the IRB more effectively.